Hi, everyone. Welcome to Breakfast After the Bell Basics. We're so pleased you are here today. Uh, I'm going to first go over a few housekeeping notes, and then we will dive right in. First, this is a 45-minute webinar. This is being recorded, and an email will be sent out uh, in a few days after the webinar um, with the PowerPoint presentation along with this recording, so you can re review this uh, PowerPoint in your leisure. Another thing is that if you have questions, uh, we do have time at the end for question and answer. So feel free to type in your questions in the question box. Uh, and that's in that right hand box that you should be able to see on your screen. If you are having any issues throughout the webinar regarding audio or visual, there is a chat box. We will be able to help you through that chat box. So don't hesitate if you're having any issues. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. Let's see. Here we go. So I'd first like to start out with introductions and let you know who is on the webinar. I'm Summer Kriegshauser, a Senior Program Manager at No Kid Hungry, and I'm joined by my colleague, Kelly McDonough, who's also here at No Kid Hungry, and she's a Program Manager as well. Together, we work to expand school breakfast across the nation, and we really focus on breakfast after the bell models, which is why we're so pleased that you're here today to talk about breakfast after the bell. So first, I want to start us off with talking a little bit about No Kid Hungry, just so you all know who we are. I think we have some familiar faces on the line, but you may not be familiar. Some other folks may not be familiar, so giving you a little bit of insight about No Kid Hungry and what we do might be helpful. Then we'll dig right into breakfast after the bell models. Then we'll talk about implementation specifics and maintenance, which we don't want to forget. And then, like I said earlier, we have uh, time for question and answer at the end. Now we have a poll. I would love to find out who is on the line. So you should be able to pull up the poll, um, or the poll should be pulling up on your screen shortly. And we'll give you about mm, 30 seconds to a minute to complete this poll. Uh, really, we're trying to figure out how familiar you are with Breakfast After the Bell so we can kind of gauge who's on the line. The options are, I have no familiarity with Breakfast After the Bell. This means you're probably hearing about it for the first time and you're here to learn. Um, you could have heard of it but not really know much about it. Uh, you could um, have it in your school or district, but you just implemented it, so maybe you're, you want to learn a little bit more about it and how to improve your program, or you're a seasoned pro, which means you could probably lead this webinar. So um, let's see, let's check to see how much we have in, what the progress is. Okay, we've closed it. Okay, so it looks like 45 or about, about half say you've heard of it. So sounds like you know a little bit about it, but maybe you're looking to learn more, and that's perfect. This is exactly the information that we will be providing today. Um, about a quarter of you have no familiarity with Breakfast After the Bell. So this is also a fantastic webinar for you today because we're going to do a nice balance of high-level information about Breakfast After the Bell and diving deep. And then we have a few others where you've actually implemented it, but it's new to your district or you're a seasoned pro. So fantastic, thank you for taking a part in the webinar, or excuse me, in the poll. All right, so No Kid Hungry, who are we? We are a campaign across the nation and we work to end childhood hunger. We do it in a few different ways. One is we work to expand access to the federal meals program. This means getting more food to kids who need it. Uh, our focus is on school breakfast after school meals and summer meals. And that really is what uh, Kelly, my colleague and I who's joining me today, that is what we focus on, expanding access to school breakfast. We also teach families through nutrition education. So we help them prepare nutritious food and really make the most of their food budgets. And then something else that we do is we do a lot of advocacy and we work with our elected officials uh, at the national, state and local level to really pass policy that moves the needle on ending childhood hunger. And here's a map of where No Kid Hungry is. We are proud to be across the, the, the country. Uh, as you can see, the orange, we have deep community investments in those states. And the yellow, we have uh, grants in those states and provide nutrition education programming. So we're really proud of our work across the nation. 
All right, let's dive right in to Breakfast After the Bell basics. We'll be talking about Breakfast After the Bell models, the participation rates that you can get with these models, and we have a lot of resources that are embedded into this PowerPoint that will help you um, moving forward with Breakfast After the Bell. So first, I want to touch upon why traditional breakfast in the cafeteria isn't the best way to get breakfast to students. Now, this webinar focuses on Breakfast After the Bell models, but it's very important to understand why breakfast after the bell models are um, more ideal than breakfast in the cafeteria before the school day starts. There are several barriers that prevent students from eating breakfast in the cafeteria before the official start of the school day. It could just be a timing issue where kids just can't get to school on time, whether it's bus schedules or carpool schedules. A lot of the time it's of no fault of their own um, that they can't get breakfast because of that. There's often a stigma for kids that eat breakfast in the cafeteria, so they will go hungry rather than eating in the cafeteria before the school day starts. The price might not be right for students. Um, we often see those middle and high school students just aren't hungry in the morning. They have a completely different um, meal pattern, and so they just don't take breakfast when it's offered first thing in the morning, and then mid-morning they get quite hungry. The cafeteria might be, not be convenient, meaning students might not have time to get breakfast, before school and then make it to class on time. And then often we see that students just want to hang out with their friends before the day starts and not just sit in the morning or sit in the cafeteria uh, and eat alone in the morning. So what's the solution? Breakfast after the bell, meaning we want to make breakfast a part of the school day. It really addresses those barriers that I just talked about and really ensures that more students have access to that healthy meal to get them to lunch. So let's talk about these breakfast after the bell models, what they look like, and what participation rates you can get uh, if you implement these models. So this slide is laid out where you have the list of the breakfast after the bell models that we know work, breakfast in the classroom, grab and go to the classroom and second chance breakfast. And then on the left hand side, you have the participation rate. Now, I just want to make clear that these participation rates are based on the cohort of free and reduced lunch eaters. Um, this is not total enrollment. So if we're looking at breakfast in the classroom where breakfast is served in the classroom and it's eaten in the classroom, those free and reduced lunch eaters, 86% of that cohort will, get, um, will eat breakfast in the classroom. So that's a great percentage. If you take a look at the bottom of the slide, where it's compared to traditional cafeteria breakfast. Again, this is where breakfast is served in the cafeteria before the school day starts. And that's only at 50%. And we just don't feel that's good enough because you have all these other models that can really provide students um, breakfast in a way that meets their needs uh, as opposed to the traditional model. So the next model that you see here is grab and go to the classroom where uh, students pick up breakfast on their way to class and then eat it in the classroom. Uh, you can reach 63% participation rate. And then the other model that we see and we find success, especially in those middle and high school, um, middle and high schools, is second chance breakfast. And this is where breakfast is served pretty much at a, a break in the morning um, or between first and second period. And this is when those middle and high school students, really their hunger starts to come on. So for them, this is a really good option to get breakfast where they weren't hungry first thing in the morning. And we see this model executed in two different ways. One is grab and go, where the carts are put out, uh, say after first period. Or we see schools open up the cafeteria again uh, in that mid-morning break, and students are given around 15 minutes to eat in the cafeteria. So this is an important slide to show you the power of breakfast after the bell and how these breakfast after the bell models really do do a great job of meeting the needs of the students and helping them uh, get access to breakfast. So I want to dive a little bit deep into each of these models to give you more information about what they look like, what they entail, so you can really understand the ins and outs of these models. So like I said, breakfast in the classroom is where breakfast is offered and served in the classroom, students eat in the classroom, um, and it usually takes only 15 minutes, and that includes cleanup. So it's not a lot of time in the, in the grand scheme of things. The prep for this is the cafeteria staff prep those breakfast items. If you have a central kitchen, you'd prep it there or the cafeteria in that particular school. Now, depending on the types of items, uh, the prep needed may need to be done right before the breakfast service starts, or if you have shelf-stable items, they can be packed the night before. So it's really about making the most of your cafeteria um, labor schedule. 
Uh, and then the execution of this is where those breakfast items are delivered to the classroom. Um, they're usually in rolling carts or on rolling crates, but somehow they have to get to the classroom from the cafeteria. And I love this because this is where students can get involved. You can really utilize students to help be a part of the breakfast program, take on leadership roles, and help deliver um, breakfast to the classroom. We see this very successfully all over the country. And then in terms of record keeping and how you, you know, claim the meals, count and claim the meals, there's a few ways that you can do it, but often we see either teachers or students track the number of students that happen to be eating that day. So it could mean along with the breakfast that's going from the cafeteria to the classroom in those um, rolling coolers or on those carts, there's a tally list, right, with all of the names of the students. And when a student takes their breakfast, they simply check off their name and that information is then sent back to the cafeteria after breakfast service is done. And then that cafeteria staff tally those numbers and it's a very simple way to count and claim meals. Now I put teachers on here because um, in lower grades where students may not be able to um, mark their own you know, name or check their own name off the list, teachers can be involved. But really, um, we wanna put as much um, ownership on the students as well because that creates buy-in for the program. And we don't wanna add another thing on the list of things that teachers already have to do. And then cleanup is also very easy. Students are completely responsible for cleaning up their own desks their own areas, and this means that classrooms get all the necessary supplies to keep their classroom clean. This is very important, and we will talk about um, implementation and things like this moving forward, but really the students are responsible for cleanup. Now, what does this look like in real time? Or not in real time, but in pictures. So I've laid out in steps one, two, three, four, Picture number one, we see all of the rolling coolers lined up, cafeteria staff are prepping them nicely, getting them ready to go. Picture number two is a student delivering those breakfasts to the classroom. This is where student volunteers come into play beautifully. Picture number three, you have a student picking up those reimbursable meal components. And picture number four is those um, things that need to go back to the cafeteria. So here we have a rolling cooler. Now students can take that back to the cafeteria or the cafeteria staff can do that. But this is one, two, three, four, an example of how breakfast in the classroom is done. All right, so let's continue on to grab and go to the classroom. And this is where breakfast is served from a central location in the school, a highly traffic location. Keep that in mind because that's very important in terms of participation. Um, and usually there's a cart or a kiosk where the breakfast items are placed on there and students simply pick up those items on the way to class. They get to class and they eat it there. Another way we see this uh, this model executed is through a quick cafeteria line. Now, if the cafeteria is conveniently located in the school where you know students have to go through the cafeteria anyway to get to class, you can easily set up all the meal components in a quick cafeteria line and students literally just go through the line and pick up their breakfast the same way that they would on a kiosk or a cart and then head to class and be able to eat in the class. So prep is sort of similar for breakfast in the classroom, except the cafeteria staff is prepping items on the, um, the cart or the kiosk or on that uh, quick cafeteria line. So, you know, you're including all your reimbursable meal components. And so once you get into that system um, and into the routine, it's quite simple and it's pretty easy. And then execution, like I just talked about, the carts or kiosks are in highly trafficked areas. Um, really, it's the students taking the breakfast and there's not that much equipment movement like there is in breakfast in the classroom. There's just one, um, or not one, but you know, the amount of carts or kiosks that you need, but there's not multiple rolling coolers or carts like you would need with breakfast in the classroom. And then record keeping, now this is different than breakfast in the classroom. Grab and go to the classroom requires a point of sale system. Um, this is the most common uh, way of tracking participation in the vast majority of schools that we work with uh, and in surveys that we've seen and it's almost impossible to track participation to track counting and claiming accurately without a point of sale system so that is something to keep in mind if you're interested in grab and go to the classroom cleanup is very similar 
uh, you're really relying on the students. You're relying on the students to clean up their desk areas. Uh, if there's any trash in the hallway, um, you just need to onboard students about what to do if a spill happens. And again, I'll get into this into the implementation section, but really it, the responsibility is mainly on the students. Of course, custodians help with this, but really giving responsibility to, to the students uh, is the most successful here. And then what does this look like? All right, we have pictures one, two, three, and four. Picture number one, we see a loaded up grab and go cart with all sorts of goodies. Picture number two, a student is taking their reimbursable meal components from a grab and go cart. Picture three is a POS system. Uh, this is an example of what a POS system looks like. You see the computer in the middle and the two keypads on either side to provide line options on both sides of this cart. And then picture number four, here is a centrally located trash can. Um, something that we see a lot is when you have breakfast that's consumed in the classroom, we like to recommend getting a trash can specifically for breakfast trash. So you have your separate trash can for papers, broken pencils, whatever sort of classroom trash you might have. But having a separate trash can specifically for breakfast trash is very helpful because then that trash is taken out to that central, centrally located um, larger trash bin in the hallway. And once breakfast is done, that breakfast trash can in the classroom is not used anymore. So having that desig those designated supplies can really help avoid having um, messes in the classroom all day uh, and have it be super organized. And teachers love super organized. All right, let's go to our next model. All right, second chance breakfast. Um, we see such good things from Second Chance Breakfast because, uh, like I said earlier, it is really successful in middle and high schools because of the time it's served. So, like I said, it's um, not served first thing in the morning. It's served during a mid-morning break or usually between first and second periods. And again, like I was saying earlier, we see this executed in two models. One is grab and go to the classroom. And so, this would be, um, an example would be, the cafeteria staff set up all of the kiosks or grab-and-go carts, the bell rings to end first period, students exit their classroom, they pick up that breakfast on the way to their second period class, and then eat in class. So you might not be losing any time in between class. Maybe you have to add a minute or two just to make sure all kids get the meal that they want. Um, but really, this is a very smooth way for kids uh, to get breakfast and great for those, again, middle and high school students. The other way we see this model executed is through uh, the cafeteria. And we do see um, schools change up their schedule to accommodate this, where they have a mid-morning break, where students can go to the cafeteria, they can sit there and eat for 15 minutes, and then regular, um, regular class schedules resume. But this is also a fun way to give students breakfast where they might not get it first thing in the morning and you know they're hungry. Um, a tell for this is if uh, students mid-morning, you see them eating, you see them eating their Pop-Tarts or their granola bars, or you know, you're hearing from the teachers that students are getting um, sort of hangry in that mid-morning hour. Being tired is also a big tell for students. So if you're seeing these things happen, um, second chance breakfast is a great option for your school because you are solving a problem that clearly exists. Prep, depending on whether you want to do a grab-and-go style or traditional cafeteria model, you just do that same kind of prep. And then execution the same way, you either do um, the grab-and-go execution like we talked about in the grab-and-go slide or the traditional cafeteria model where you do essentially regular cafeteria breakfast just after um, first period or mid-morning break. Record keeping, this is also a point of sale system model. Because you're doing grab and go, or you could be doing stuff in the cafeteria, a point of sale system is your choice here. And then cleanup, again, it's the same as the grab and go or traditional cafeteria model, depending on what you want. And so I don't have pictures for these because we already talked about um, what grab and go looks like, and I'm sure you're already very familiar with what cafeteria breakfast looks like. So this is our first of many slides that have resources to assist you with this. So in addition to this webinar, um, we at No Kid Hungry have a website called the Center for Best Practices, which is what is hyperlinked at the very bottom of this slide here. And we have over 400 resources that are here to help you 
um, expand school breakfast, implement um, various models, uh, along with school breakfast, but after school meals and, and summer meals. So we are giving a lot of resources. I mean, all these resources are free, but embedding them in this PowerPoint so that you can have them. So I encourage you to go through this PowerPoint when you get it in your inbox and look at all these things. We have specific teacher resources. Um, we have videos to help show school stakeholders what these models look like. Um, and yeah, lots of stuff, lots of good stuff. Okay, let's dive into a little bit of information about implementation. We'll talk about the importance of assembling a school breakfast team, uh, planning implementation, and really troubleshooting, because those are very important aspects of implementation. So, so first things first, assemble a school breakfast team. Now this is a team full of school stakeholders or district stakeholders. Uh, this could be teachers, principals, wellness coordinators, really anyone who will be touching the school breakfast program in any way, shape, or form. It doesn't have to be every single person in the school, but it has to be a stakeholder representative of a certain um, stakeholder. So you can have one or two teachers that are really representing, uh, same thing with wellness coordinators, et cetera, et cetera. And the goal here is a couple things. So one, it's to help those stakeholders understand the importance of expanding access to school breakfast. I'm sure you already have school breakfast in your school, but how many students are actually eating? So helping school stakeholders to understand the importance of increasing access by changing these models um, can be key. Something you can do is to visit other schools that already have breakfast after the bell in place, that have a program that's smooth, because oftentimes it's really hard to imagine what breakfast after the bell looks like um, and how it folds into the school day. So that's something to think about. Reach out to your contacts in other schools and see if you can set up a breakfast after the bell site visit. The um, school breakfast team also gives stakeholders a voice to address concerns, uh, but it also helps gain buy-in. Um, any stakeholders who can make or break this program need to be a part of the school breakfast team because they can help troubleshoot and they can be crucial to helping plan a successful breakfast after the bell implementation plan. Um, so that's the main thing is you want them to help plan this implementation. You wanna to bring together this team regularly before you actually launch the breakfast after the bell program. And then after you launch the program, still meet with them, but it should be on an ad hoc basis depending on what you need. And I have a resource link to the bottom here called Talking Points for Introducing Breakfast After the Bell to School Stakeholders, which really helps um, explain the importance of Breakfast After the Bell and why changing over to Breakfast After the Bell models um, is beneficial to really everyone in the school. All right, let's talk about an implementation timeline because this is another important thing. So, okay, you have your school breakfast team, Something that needs to happen with the school breakfast team is to have a project manager in place. There are gonna be a lot of moving pieces, which is totally understandable, but you should have a person that is really managing the implementation process and have somebody accountable for this and being able to be the connector to all the stakeholders. You also want technical experts on this team. So you're gonna need cafeteria staff that are familiar with breakfast um, and breakfast equipment, things like that, because that will add another important piece to a successful implementation plan. When you're thinking about implementation, some things to consider are what sort of facilities your school has, how the school is laid out, um, what kind of equipment you might need, depending on the breakfast after the bell model, what kind of food, meaning um, are you gonna have your regular menu or change over to a different menu? Uh, how are you going to obtain the equipment? Are you going to be applying for grants or do you have that money in your food service budget already? How long is that equipment procurement going to take? Menu planning. This could be um, a discussion between, excuse me, the cafeteria staff, the teachers, maybe even students. Getting more people involved can be helpful in, some, in, uh, in this kind of situation. Um, what does the school layout look like? If you are choosing grab and go, you need to think about where those highly trafficked hallways are to put the cart at so that you get the most bang out of your buck in terms of um, most, more students coming by. How are you gonna market this? Uh, there are many school stakeholders that need to be notified about this. And don't forget parents. Parents are a big stakeholder too. And then after thinking about all of that, when is that launch date? Now this might seem like a lot, so counting back 
thinking back, thinking, okay, I need to do all of these things. How long is that going to take? And working your way back might give you a better sense of how long that implementation process is actually going to take. We've also seen schools do a dry one or a dress rehearsal, um, which can be super fun and also super successful because as much as you think through everything that's, that you need to do, stuff is going to come up that, that didn't occur to you. And so that dress rehearsal can help you troubleshoot before the actual uh, start date. And here are some additional resources to help. We have menu resources, um, we have a pre-implementation checklist, and we even have rollout timelines for breakfast in the classroom and grab and go to the classroom. I just want to add in a little bit about equipment needs because I want to bucket equipment needs into two categories. You have your school nutrition equipment, which could be your rolling coolers, your carts and your kiosks. We have pictures here of the school nutrition equipment, but there's also the classroom and hallway equipment that you don't don't want to forget and this is where I was talking about when students are responsible for cleaning up their space what are those students going to need to make sure that they have um, clean spaces so you might have trash cans heavy-duty trash bags wet wipes things like that and talking to teachers is essential for um, figuring out what classrooms are going to need and the resource connected to this at the bottom is breakfast after the bell equipment tips Parent outreach. I have a whole slide on this because it's vital that you notify parents about breakfast after the bell. If, um, if your child is in a school that's implementing breakfast after the bell, think about everything that you'd want to know about the program. You want to know why it's happening, what, what the start date of the program is. Uh, what are the models that are being offered? What's on the menu? Is it universal breakfast? All of these things are vital for parents because getting parent buy-in will filter down to um, the students and hopefully get more breakfast participation. So I have a list of ways you can get that out there. You can put it on the school website, send home flyers. The more ways you reach parents, the better, because we know parents are busy, and if you just use one thing to reach out to them, they may not get it. So reaching out to parents in multiple ways um, is super helpful. And here are some resources to help. We have a breakfast FAQs for parents, which is the first bullet. These are customizable resources that you can plug in your school's information, time, breakfast after the bell model, price of the meals. We have, um, it's essentially a template for you to use and make your own, and then you can send that out to parents. We also have a whole list of flyers that you can use. And again, all of these can be found on our Center for Best Practices website. You don't want to forget onboarding. This is another big one because school stakeholders need to know what to expect. Um, and so they need to have their own onboarding training. This means you might need to do a teacher training. You might need to do a custodial training. Definitely doing a student training and onboarding. Um, so that way when launch day comes, you are ready to go. Everything is in place. All stakeholders are familiar with what's going to happen and why it's going to happen, and so you can have as smooth a launch as possible. You know, we talk to schools who say, you know, maybe there were some kinks in the first day or two, but every day that goes by, it's gotten smoother and smoother and smoother, and within a week, it's a well-oiled machine. So onboarding, onboarding, onboarding is one of the keys to that success. All right, we're at maintenance. This means being able to adapt your program getting observations and getting feedback in real time, and still utilizing that breakfast team because they are still a vital group to making sure your breakfast after the bell program is a success. So you might need to adapt your program. This, this is totally normal. It happens, you might need to tweak things here and there, um, and that's just a part of making a successful program. Now, helping you do that is getting observations in real time from student stakeholders, or stakeholders. Uh, students being one of the big ones. So this might be, mean student surveys, you could be asking students. Um, some other things that you can do to get feedback is quantitative analysis. Look at your meal counts. See what your breakfast participation is. See how it's increased or decreased depending on the week, depending on what's being served. Um, these are ways that you can really take a look and analyze how your breakfast program is doing. Waste is another thing. Check to see how much of that food is being thrown away, um, and maybe talk to students who are throwing away that food and ask them why. This could be an opportunity to involve students in helping develop the menu, doing taste tests, so you can really adapt the program in a realistic way um, to help the students uh, feel engaged, 
but, but also make the breakfast program appeal, uh, appealing to them. There are also qualitative things that you can do. Get those um, check-ins with that school breakfast team. This is an opportunity for stakeholders to voice what's happening, to voice successes and things that could be worked on, but being able to check in with that team is crucial uh, because then you get first-hand knowledge of what's happening in the school and what's happening in classrooms. And then, of course, you could do informational interviews if you want, um, really just to get more feedback to help make your program more successful. And then, of course, convening that school breakfast team on an ad hoc basis um, could be quarterly at this point, really depends on um, what you need, but being able to utilize that school breakfast team, that's what it's there for. And the folks that are on the team have already committed to wanting to make this program work. And here are some No Kid Hungry webinars that uh, give even more information about Breakfast After the Bell. A few months back, we did Getting Ready for Breakfast After the Bell, and that is a webinar that's even more extensive than this one in terms of Breakfast After the Bell detail and really getting into the nitty gritty of preparing for implementing a Breakfast After the Bell program. Again, these are hyperlinks, so when you get this uh, PowerPoint in your inbox uh, in a few days, days after this webinar, you can go ahead and click on that and watch that in your free time. And then we have uh, best practices for high schools. Uh, we also have a menu planner uh, webinar that we did with the Alliance for a Healthier Generation. They have this fabulous tool called the Smart Food Planner that has all sorts of menu items um, for breakfast after the bell, from scratch cooking items to uh, items where you can utilize economies of scale. So it's a really fantastic tool and I highly recommend um, taking a look at that. And then we have a webinar for grab and go best practices. So these are other things to support your program uh, and really dive even deeper on how to make the most of your program. So here we are already at time for questions. Uh, we have a lot of good uh, a lot of time available and I do believe we have questions in the question box. And so we're just going to take a look at those. Well, while you all think about some questions, um, this is Summer's colleague, Kelly. Summer introduced me at the beginning of this webinar, and we tag team our breakfast support here at the Center for Best Practices. And while Summer was presenting to you all, I thought of some bonus tips to share that we've learned along the way here. And one of my favorite ones is to think about launching your new Breakfast After the Bell program on a Tuesday rather than a Monday. Um, which would allow your nutrition services staff um, to pack and prepare on Monday and really set the foundation for a strong launch week. Um, something else to consider when planning your timeline, if you need to order equipment, be sure to plan your launch date accordingly to account for delivery time. Um, that's something you want to be aware of. While you might be very enthusiastic to start your program as soon as possible, um, make sure that you have everything in place so that you can successfully do so. Um, another tip is that um, I think we can all agree that schools are places of routine. Um, starting a Breakfast After the Bell program at the start of the new school year or when school resumes after a holiday break tends to be best received, although you can of course launch a new program whenever is best for your school. Um, lastly, what I would say is know that the first couple of days might not go super smoothly and that is totally okay. Um, generally, the bumps in the road smooth out by the end of launch week, and if you have your school breakfast team in place to troubleshoot, um, you're going to be in a really great place by the end of the week. So if anyone has questions, we are checking that box we have now. We a lot of questions, so I'm just going to go ahead and read them, and then Summer and Kelly can answer. Um, the first question is, how do you deal with a stubborn administrator? who might be too afraid of messes in the school and shuts down any talk of breakfast after the bell? Yeah, that's a great question and a common question that we hear. So something to think about is what are the pain points of that administrator? What does that administrator struggle with? Um, is it disciplinary issues? Or are they worried about test scores? Are kids not coming to class on time in the morning? Really thinking about what keeps that administrator up at night because a lot of these things 
actually can be affected by kids eating breakfast in the morning and having a good meal. And so we do have research and studies to show that kids who eat school breakfast in the morning have less dis disciplinary issues. They do better on test scores. Um, they're able to focus better. Teachers, we hear them talk about having actually more instructional time um, with breakfast after the bell because teachers aren't having to use their time disciplining students and sending them to the principal's office. So these are something to think about in terms of how you approach a school administrator and really thinking about what would help them in their day-to-day, -day, knowing that they have a million things on their plate and they just want things to go smoothly. Something else you can do is do a site visit. If that administrator is open to go visiting another school to see Breakfast After the Bell in action, this can be a game changer. This is a very powerful tool in showing school stakeholders what Breakfast After the Bell looks like, how smooth it can be, how beneficial and successful it can be, one other thing I'd recommend is tap into um, any sort of peer networks that you know are out there. So if there's another school administrator that you can reach out to that uh, has his school, his or her school has implemented Breakfast After the Bell, see if you can um, create a line of communication between the administrator that you're trying to sway and that administrator that has already implemented Breakfast After the Bell. That peer-to-peer -peer communication, hearing it from another administrator, can be super influential uh, in just even shifting their mind to, to a maybe instead of a hard no. Kelly, do you want to add anything? Nope. Actually, Summer touched upon 99% um, of the notes that I just jotted down myself. I think the one last bit I'll share, which is something we kind of remind ourselves as well so that we do practice what we preach, is sometimes it's best to talk less and listen more in that regard and really find out, you know, take the time um, to ask the questions and really get at, um, like Summer, Summer shared, you know, what is at the root of that concern um, so that then you can jump in, you know, with solutions um, and make them feel at ease and make them feel comfortable. I think sometimes when we're really excited and we want to move something forward, we tend to kind of put all the information out there at the get-go. Um, but take that time to find out, you know, um, you know, what has their experience been in the past or what are their current perceptions about it? Um, so listen more and really find out, um, you know, what, what they're concerned about. Great. So we have a lot more questions. Thank you for submitting. The next question is, does this program work well for schools with only about 30% free and reduced price students? Um, our guest is worried about full paying students feeling like they're missing out. Yeah, this is a good one. So if I understood the question correctly, you have a low free and reduced rate. Um, and so your concern is, can you read the last part of the question again, please? About full price uh -huh. students missing out. Uh -huh. So can you explain how Breakfast After the Bell works with? Yeah, so this is something that's come out, up a lot, actually, um, because there is a misconception that Breakfast After the Bell only works in schools that have universal breakfast um, or even CEP. And this is not the case. We hear examples and we work with schools that are not universal and are not CEP and actually do have relatively low free and reduced rates and still do breakfast after the bell successfully. It's really being smart how you promote breakfast after the bell and how you do the counting and claiming. So a big part is notifying students and notifying parents of the change um, and having a letter sent out to parents, notifying parents that if they do not want their child to partake in the program, they can opt out. So that's one is notifying parents, giving them all the options. Um, but you know, when students participate in breakfast in the classroom and they see their peers participating, they oftentimes want to participate. And so it's making parents aware that this is really a, a community feel that eat, chill, um, kids eating in the classroom with their peers can be a very positive thing in the morning. Um, and so it might be worth parents thinking about giving their child an option to do that. Um, but if not, then not creating any sort of odd dynamic in the classroom, allowing those kids who want to be a part of the program or um, partake in the program be a part of that, and working with the teacher to provide um, activities where breakfast is not the main focus. So that way when students are eating in the class, Classroom. They're also reviewing lessons. Maybe they're asking questions about homework. So there's something else going on where the focus 
just isn't breakfast, um, so that it, it's not like an elephant in the room. Um, Kelly, do you have any? Sure, what I would briefly add to that is what we see, um, one of the challenges with traditional cafeteria breakfast is that there's oftentimes stigma um, that the students that are going to the cafeteria to get breakfast are those quote unquote poor students. Um, and what we see about breakfast after the bell is actually great at reducing stigma because we see more students across socioeconomic economic lines participating in the program. Um, I would just um, encourage us to think back to one of the earlier slides in the webinar where we talked about the different barriers that exist um, that leads to traditional breakfast not really working. Um, so students who are arriving late, the cafeteria being far away from where the students are entering, um, students preferring to hang out with their friends, those are all factors, um, again, that are crossing um, across lines from the free and reduced price lunch paying students to those who are paying full price. So when we're bringing the breakfast to the students, we're really seeing this being a program that can benefit all students. Great. Next question is about piloting a breakfast in the classroom program. So someone asked the question that they have a principal who's on board, but teachers are not so open to the idea. So they're thinking of trying a pilot to test it out and get them on board. So they're wondering how many classrooms would be good to start with for a pilot and how long they should run the pilot to show the teachers that this can work in their school. This is super exciting that you have a principal that's on board, but you have teachers that maybe aren't quite on board yet. Yet is the main word here. Um, you just need one classroom. You need one classroom to start. That's all you need. Get a teacher champion. Get a teacher that is willing to give it a go. Um, that can exhibit how Breakfast After the Bell can be just a fabulous opportunity for the entire school. And that information will, will come out. Um, in terms of how long the pilot should be. I mean, you can set it for a week, two weeks, a month. Really talk to that teacher and see what they are open to. Um, if possible, I would give it over a week, even over two weeks. That way you can work out any kinks, knowing that there will be some kinks in the system the first week. Um, so that way, you know, once the second week rolls around, you really, like I said, have a well-oiled machine in terms of that Breakfast After the Bell program. And then have that teacher speak about his or her success. Have that teacher talk about how the students have received breakfast after the bell, how um, their focus has changed, how maybe their actual test scores have changed, um, how they don't ask, when is lunch, when is lunch, when is lunch, or do you have any food for me to eat, teacher? Uh, because these things will go away when you provide students food and so they're not focused on their hungry bellies. So I would say just Start with that one. If you have more than one teacher, by all means, get as many as you can on board, but all you really need is one, and then the rest of the teachers will really see, um, see the light. Something else that I will add, if you have um, siblings in the school that are in different grades in different classrooms, it's an interesting dynamic to have um, one child get, say, breakfast in the classroom, and another child in another grade not get it because then there is sort of an equal opportunity thing happening there. So if you have teacher pushback where some teachers just don't want to partake in breakfast in the classroom or breakfast after the bell and some do, um, getting parents involved knowing that one child is getting breakfast after the bell while the other isn't can be a motivator um, and a heavy influencer for teachers to change their mind because if one child is getting something and the other one isn't, um, parents aren't likely to receive that favorably. Next question is, is breakfast after the bell in place of traditional cafeteria breakfast? So this will be our last question because we are just a minute over. Um, so the question is, does breakfast after the bell replace traditional cafeteria breakfast? Um, it really depends on your situation. It doesn't have to. The point of breakfast after the bell is to offer breakfast still after the official start of the school day, after that bell has rung, and continue it on for a good 15 minutes after the bell has rung. That means whether it's breakfast in the classroom or grab and go to the classroom, leaving those carts out uh, so that students still have access to breakfast even after the bell has rung. So we see situations where both is happening, where there's traditional cafeteria and say grab and go to the classroom at the same time, and we see where one has replaced the other. So it's really dependent on your situation. 
Kelly, anything to add there? Nope, I think Summer has it all covered. All right. So folks, it looks like we are out of time. We went a little bit over, so our apologies for that. Um, there's, I think it's still quite a few more questions. Um, I think we have, if you registered you and you left your email, we have your information so we can reach out to you personally and answer your question. And we thank you all so much. Like I said, we will be sending out the PowerPoint. Oh, actually, one more thing. We have another webinar coming up. Save the date for um, Thursday, September 27th. Kelly will be leading this webinar. Kelly, do you want to say anything about this webinar? Sure, I'll super briefly say that this is um, a great extension on what we covered today and a great extension on some of the questions that you all have asked. And I do just want to give you all a big thank you for asking your questions. We really appreciate your participation. Um, so this is actually going to be an exciting opportunity. It's going to be um, a bit of a panel discussion. We're going to be joined for, um, by three experts um, from across the country who have that on-the-ground experience um, working within schools and districts. Um, and we are going to be having a conversation specific to gaining teacher and principal buy-in for Breakfast After the Bell. Um, so we definitely encourage you all to join us um, in a couple of weeks for our next webinar. Fabulous. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Have a wonderful rest of your day.